ever heard of an african-centric kingdom that built its economic around the atlantic slave trade so much was the dependency that its economic collapse only happened in the wake of abolishing slavery across europe and north america when history testified for the hierarchies of african oppression the dahomey kingdom makes the list for one reason and another rings a bell your local theater is probably showing the woman king which is inspired by the the female warriors of the same Western African Empire. But like every time, historical period drama in Hollywood aren't always banking on facts. So is the woman king lying to you? And that's where I come in. From the ritualistic religion practice to the brutal feminine military forces, I'm bringing the stories of the Dahomey to you. <laughs> Let's get started. Why is Dahomey an interesting case study? The southern part of the present day Benin is going to see some surge in its tourism numbers thanks to the women's skin's beautiful cinematography and representing a period of history that's often left in the margins. Your history book won't teach you about the Dahomey Kingdom, and that's honestly a shame. This particular kingdom is so interesting to study because of its duality of its periodization. Let us give you a hint. Now, typical, when you talk about a pre-colonial African kingdom, you're going to hear about how rich, progressive, and well-governed it was. For the most part, those characterization remain true. That was the case for the Dahomey Kingdom too. If anything, the people were so fiercely loyal to the crown that even the European had to think for a moment before you know planning the big colonial project. But that's just one part of the story. Before the kingdom fell into the colonial hands of the French, it was best friend with the Europeans. And yeah, this is your classic trope of best friends to enemies, but there's no going back. Why don't we know much about the Queen Hagby of Dahomey? Before the Europeans started to strike deals with the kingdom, indigenous populations, sure, the rulers prosper in their own right, but the empire wasn't drowning in riches in the beginning. Dahomey's capital was Abome, which was founded by Dogberry in 1620. His rule ended in turmoil when internal disagreement over the crown broke out among his brothers. No one is surprised by this development. Soon enough, he fled not before he initiated some violent invasion and conquest to make Abome his capital in the truest sense. His legacy was continued by his brothers and later on by a woman warrior, Hangbi. All right, if you have watched The Woman King, I should tell you that Nasika wasn't inspired by Queen Tassie Hangbi. That would have been super badass, but unfortunately, the timeline don't match. First thing first, the female ruler of Dahomey came into power before King Gezo and didn't necessarily lead a regiment of Amazon esque warriors. Even then, for a male centric leadership, the role of Hangbi is applauded as it should. In present day Benin, outside of historical tracing, very little is known about her rule in a deliberate attempt. A kingdom couldn't thrive in the power struggle that followed after her occupation of the throne. In fact, it is a classic tale of revenge. Hang Bi's rule came after the sudden demise of King Akaba, who's known to take the homies across the Weme River in modern Benin. At the apex of her rule, a succession rule broke out between Agbo, Sasa, and Ajaga, where the queen's overwhelming support the former. Well, surprise, surprise, that made Ajaga upset to the point that when he took the throne, he specifically ordered the historian to remove any details about Hangbei's rule. Yikes. So we could have had some super cool receipt about how Western Africa looked like under a woman's rule. But some centuries of revenge 
quest is something we have to settle for. Why did Dahomey became the hub of enslaved people? As much as I would like to talk about Queen Tassi, it is the rule of King Gezo that makes the headline. And again, if you've watched The Woman King, you know he's the real deal for many reasons. One of them is the unpopular economic policy of his time. Well, by his standards, he was doing the right thing by essentially raking good money for his kingdom. Yeah, the GDP was booming. Homer's exports were being brought at a very profitable cost. But here's the thing, that profitable cost wasn't just currency or coins. Those were actual human life engulfed under the name of prisoners of war or captive slaves. Now, you know an African kingdom that only brought itself on the map by enthusiastically participating in the Atlantic slave trade of the 18th and 19th centuries. Let's break this down, shall we? Like every other African kingdom, the Hume also had an export niche in palm oil. Those who have watched the movie know how important of a role oil production play in tracing economic of modern day Benin. Yet for a kingdom that was heavily involved in a war making and military conquest, palm oil wouldn't win Gezo a piece of land. You could earn quick money by selling oil to the Portuguese ruler. You can't get rid of enemies with just coins. So here's what happened. The home started to get quick access to the European going on a war starter pack, including rifles, gunpowder, tobacco, alcohol, and all sorts in exchange for what they had in surplus. Unfortunately, the kingdom idea of surplus good came as slaves from their royal plantation, which Europeans desperately needed to run their economics. Soon enough, the trading parties fell into a cycle. The Homo will fight and win wars, captive slaves, trade them to the Europeans, and its economic will keep running. The process became so important for the kingdom's survival that a Portuguese slave trader conspired to bring Gezo onto the throne to keep the Homo in the slave trading business and ho oh, the popular slave trader was seen as santo ferreira in the movie what is really interesting to see is that we don't see the colonization of the homies land in the early waves of european invasion the kingdom has its specific history of being colonized by the french but we only see that after the anti-abolitionist movement one argument could be the kingdom fierce military, including the brutal Amazon warriors who didn't let their enemies see the light of the day. Was their war making towards, let's say, uh, the Portuguese? Not at all. So here's when you see the larger picture. The kingdom of the Home was useful for the European as its conflict reading nature meant a stable supply of enslaved people. Who would want to mess with that sort of supply chain system? Historians would argue that the only reason why Dahome stayed away from the colonial radar was because of its role in the slave trade system. But of course, every cause of oppression sees its ends. How did Dahome see its decline? In the 1840s, there was a European demand to end the slave trade. Yeah, that's your cue to notice the the irony of it all. When the news reached the home, they knew the end of their economic progress was near. They were still fighting wars and had a cohort of enslaved captives. There are certain accounts when the kingdom pushed to make the slave trade with businesses that were still banking on the plantation system. Soon enough, the British Royal Navy noticed and effectively blocked the home from making any trades. Plus, their West African squadron effectively took control of the naval route that the kingdom had used to make some quick cash. Later on, the kingdom was colonized by the French and the rule continued till the Homer's independence in 1958.
8. The remnant of the kingdom's role in enslaving Africans are largely missing from the popular media. The woman king is cool and resonating, but does it explore the tragic realities of the homeless collision with the Atlantic slave trade? Not really, no. That brings us to perhaps the most celebrated part of the old Benin, an entire regiment of female warriors that didn't joke around. Who are the Amazon warriors of Dahomey. Thanks to the evolution of Black Panther, we have a fierce visual of how African women organized themselves into a disciplined force that was a force to be reckoned with. Wakanda is a fiction, yet it does a good job of representing the aesthetic of an all-female army. What you don't know is that the real Amazon warrior of Dahomey were actually part of the military as a strategy to take the enemy of God. Basically, women were included in the military to elevate the size of its regiments and female so-called warriors will do the menial stuff, hold the banners, wave the flags, bring water and so on. The warriors became the most loyal palace guard and rigorously pushed the homeless military conquest. Sound badders, right? Here's the thing though, the women can lied to you. Why is the woman king so controversial? And the plot thickens, or rather the plot of the movie start to see some historical accuracy. It wasn't just Geyser who partake in the slave trading. Sorry to bust your bubble, but the very ethical fears and goje won't be celebrated as heroes if you knew this little fact about them. They were very much involved in the slave raiding process for the king. In the movie, we see Nasika as the advocate of the enslaved people. She actively pushes for Geza to cut ties with the Atlantic slave trade. In actuality, this never happened. What we think about is the patriarchal nature of Dahomey, an independent regiment of Amazon warriors under a totalitarian ruler is a huge feat. Sure, even then, at the end of the day, those strong women reported to a man for slave raiding and everything else. The burial of Hang Bay legacy is another point of conversation. So when we know this fact, does it make sense for the woman king to create space for the Amazon warriors? Sure, yet their complicity in one of the biggest crimes against humanity stands untouched, unbothered even. Do you think the woman king has the right to celebrate Amazon warriors of the home? Let us know in the comments below. If you like the video, give it a big thumbs up and make sure to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. I'll see you soon with another one.